Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Melissa Siegel. I'm a professor of migration studies, and this is a channel about all things migration. And today we're going to continue with our country case study series, where we take a deep dive and look at the migration situation in a specific country, starting with the migration history, then going on to the migration policy, and then the current migration situation. And today we are going to be looking at Senegal. And I'm going to start off here with looking at the migration history of Senegal. We'll start with an early history, then focus on the European rule, a colonial period when we had Senegalese independence, the post-independence period, and then up until today. So let's jump right in and get started. So many of the pre-colonial societies in Senegal were very adaptable and responsive to changes. Um, in labor demand and migration was commonly labor driven. From between around 1000 and, six, and around the 1600s, various Muslim kingdoms established themselves in the Senegal River, River Valley and uh, sparred with each other during this time. Additionally, Portuguese traders showed up in the uh, 1400s and established a post in the mouth of the Senegal River subsequently, of course, expanding their presence southward towards the coast. Then we had the Dutch and the French traders that showed up around the 1600s and overpowered the Portuguese and forced them out of the region. So we had really a European kind of ruling period between the 1600s and the 1890s. And during this period, we already saw a very important source of mobility being the port of Dakar. It was built um, under French rule in the 1800s and it became, began regular operations in 1866. At this time, Dakar became an economic hub of global significance and was the largest West African city east of Nigeria during the mid-1900s. While the port is a clear mechanism for travel, especially to Europe and first mainly France, we see that the port has played an important part in mobility in Senegalese history. In general, those living closer to the, to the port are believed to have more access to migrant networks that connect them with people in destination countries and can even ensure access, for instance, to loans and services in different ways. So with the advent of better telecommunications, migrant networks influence is not as directly related uh, um, to the port or households or villages from the port, but historically it was definitely an important aspect. Another important aspect historically has been rail connections. So the French government approved a railway construction in 1879 and then it was built in the, the next years. Um, and this was the Dakar to St. Louis line that passed through the critical peanut producing areas, at, which was a highly traded good at the time. The Dakar to Niger line was also completed in the 1920s, but it, and it became a really prominent mobility source for Easterward migrating Senegalese after French colonial rule. Later, we'll also see in the policy and current migration videos that Senegal's participation in uh, the ECOWAS Freedom of Movement Agreement provides another source of mobility and open borders, but we'll check those out later in the next video. Now let's look at the colonial period between 1895 and 1960. There were a few specific countries of immigrant origin that were important during this period that had immigration into Senegal. So the first is France. So Senegal was part of the fresh West Africa during this time period. And as such, then French immigrants were typically employees of the colonial administration. And we saw more and more movement there. Their activities were generally focused on commercial trade, and while most French, French citizens left after 1960s, after the independence period, there was a group that still remained. Another important group were the Lebanese. The late 1800s saw waves of Lebanese emigration, and the first of these emigrants reached Senegal in the final years of the 1800s. These migrants were integrated into mainly um, into trade and initially in the peanut trade. In a post-independence period, um, Senegalese lobbyists negotiated to actually ban Lebanese settlers, and this was in the 1970s. 
This ban was, of course, though not entirely effective and did not keep the Lebanese immigrant stock from uh, uh, rising in the following years. Even going into the 2000s, Lebanese traders still control a significant amount of commercial activity in Senegal. So now let's talk about Senegalese independence, which happened um, in 1960. And we really saw at that period then that Senegal also emerged as a prominent African migrant destination. Let's first talk about Guinea. Uh, between 1958 and 1984, the influx of Ghanaians fleeing oppression in their own country um, really started to rise. Roughly 300,000 persons in the 1970s fled to Senegal, but, but this fell to 45,000 after the previous pre president's death. If we look at Guinea-Bissau, another neighboring country, uh, between 1963 and 1974, there was the War of Independence, and that drove around 75,000 people to Senegal during this war period. We can also look at Mauritania. So while Mauritanians had been in Senegal participating in the retail trade before independence, the stock in Senegal rose to almost a quarter of a million after independence. This large of Mauritanians would drop significantly, though, due to the 1989 ethnically motivated violence um, that, that happened and really made it a less hospitable place for Mauritanians. So we can also look at the Gambia. So its only land border with Africa is actually through Senegal. The two countries maintain continuous ties and see large amounts of cross-border mo mobility. And you can also see here how Gambia is really kind of encompassed within Senegal. So Senegal plays a very important role for the Gambia. Now there was also an expansion of Senegalese emigrant destinations in Africa in a post-independence period. Pre-independence, the top destinations were Mauritania, Mali, Guinea, and Guinea-Bissau. But we saw uh, an emergence more of the Ivory Coast and Gabon as important destinations in the 1960s. So both countries experienced a high demand for labor during this period, and both countries gained independence from France in 1960, which may partly explain, of course, their increased demand for African labor. Central African countries also emerged as important destinations in the early 1970s particularly Congo, which was Brazzaville during that time, Zaire, and Cameroon. The region's main trade was diamonds and precious stones, and there was an important labor demand also there. Then there was a shrinking of Senegalese emigrants, um, well, Senegalese emigrant destinations in Africa between the 1970s and the 1990s. So if we first look at Central African countries, late in the 1970s, there was an economic collapse that really halted the demand for diamond and precious stone laborers at the time. And then in the 1990s, wars in the Congo and Zaire effectively stopped Senegalese migration to the region, which of course makes complete sense. In 1989, the mass expulsion of Senegalese migrants from Mauritania. Then if we look at Ivory Coast and Gabon, there was a rise of xenophobia in the early 1990s and 2000, and that really incited mass returns of migrants to Senegal at the time. And in 2002, during the first Ivorian civil war, violence was, was deliberately directed towards Senegalese migrants, and this effectively stopped Senegalese migrants migration to the Ivory Coast during this period. At the same time, the attractiveness of oil producing countries like Libya began in the 1990s and we started to see a switch of where people were very interested in going. Then we can talk about the expansion of Senegalese emigration destinations in Europe and North America in the mid to late 1900s. So of course we should first talk about France who has important historical ties with Senegal. Um, the Senegalese emigration to France began, of course, during the colonial rule when migrants were enlisted in the French colonial army. So the Marseille Harbor became a significant employer of Senegalese migrants after colonial rule ended, and trade between France and West Africa remained an attractive industry for migrant workers through the 1980s. A 1985 policy mandated a visa for Senegalese migrants in France, and then France subsequently became less important 
for a, France became a less important destination for Senegalese after this happened. So let's start off with looking at Italy. The government actually passed regularization programs in 1990 and 1994 that actually helped the Senegalese to regularize their status within Italy and uh, migrants were able to work in the tourism industry. Well, in tourism and in other industry. Then if we look at Spain, migrant workers were attracted to agriculture and construction industries in Spain during the 1990s. We can also look at North America. The United States saw growth in trade relations between Senegal and the US in the 1990s, and main, many middle-class younger migrants found work in this trade industry. New York City in particular has seen a significant Senegalese population. Younger migrants though from a lower socioeconomic background also travel to the United States, although their work is usually in the low skill, low pay sectors. We'll also see in the policy and migration today videos that Gulf states and even some Asian countries are now becoming attractive destinations for Senegalese emigrants. Internal migration is also very important in Senegal. Um, Senegal underwent a uh, structural adjustment that focused on privatization in 1985. And this made urban areas like Dakar favorable to labor-seeking migrants and is therefore often cited as the start of more serious rural to urban migration in the country. We'll also see later in the Migration Today video that more temporary studies really acknowledge this rural to rural and also urban to urban movements rather than only rural to urban internal migration. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. So let's talk about um, irregular migration a bit. So irregular migration is of course historically very difficult to measure. There are many and there are many forms of intercontinental Senegalese migration that we've seen in the late 1900s and especially the early 2000s to Europe which definitely do have a characteristic of irregularity. And what is irregularity? So being irregular is basically not having a correct visa or not having the right to either enter or stay um, or even work in the country. So we do see Senegalese emigration to Europe very much characterized during the 1990s and 2000s by this irregular movement and irregular work. Senegalese immigrants are rarely given long-term residency in Europe since these countries um, are often looking more for seasonal labor migration, especially of lower skilled migrants. So migrants generally entered on tourists and business visas that basically expired and then they ended up going into irregularity um, upon failure because they did not return to Senegal. For those entering Europe irregularly, there were a few paths. So there were two sub-Saharan routes in the late 1900s. So you have the Eastern route via Agadez through Niger and then via the Libyan Mediterranean coast and then taking a boat to Italy. So another route was via the Western route. So that was via Northwestern Algeria to Northern Morocco and then taking a boat to Spain. But increased border protection in the early 2000s really started to divert these different kinds of transit routes. So more migrants were departing from the Moroccan Atlantic coast bound for the Canary Islands. And in 2006, there was an estimated around, um, it was estimated that around half of migrants using this route were actually from Senegal. There are of course a lot of perils of this type of uh, um, irregular migration to Europe and using these different types of transit zones. And this, these kind of perilous journeys have deterred Senegalese emigrants from attempting the journey in the past decade and a half. It doesn't mean that it is stopped, but perhaps lessened to some extent. We'll also look at this a little bit more in our Migration Today video. So let's look a little bit at forced migration and the history of forced migration in Senegal. Senegal's history doesn't contain many instances of rep repression and involuntary mobility. But there was um, an internal successionist movement between the 1980s until today. Most conflict occurs in the southwest region of Senegal, and that's where we've seen 
um, yeah, more, more difficulties. While most displacement has been internal in the country, Guinea-Bissau and Gambia jointly host between 10,000 and 15,000 Senegalese refugees, or did so in 2005. There's also the conflict with Mauritania in 1989. This was a debate over um, grazing rights along the Senegal-Mauritania border, which escalated into a significant humanitarian crisis. Um, there were really two groups that were involved in this. So you had the black Africans and then the Arab Berber populations, both living in Mauritania. And uh, uh, the government primarily was controlled at this time by Arab Berbers. The black ethnic groups were expelled from Mauritania and then Senegal subsequently expelled Mauritanians. So there was definitely forced migration on both sides. The conflict though did de-escalate in the following decade and as of the mid 2000s, roughly 50,000 Senegalese migrants were living in Mauritania again. So I hope this just gave you a quick look at the migration history of Senegal. Again, please do check out the videos on migration policy and what's going on with regard to migration today. You can also check out our other videos in these, um, in these country series if you're interested. We've covered many more videos also on the channel. And if you like this video, of course, don't forget to like, subscribe to the channel, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of my videos that I upload every week. And I hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.